That was a DJ tournament, yeah. Bro, I would come home drunk because the bars in North Carolina closed at two, right? South Carolina closed at two, so you know the Turbo Hunter was three a.m. start time. I would come home shit faced so many times and rest that tournament. I won it a few times. I prayed a few times, and I fell asleep with all the chips in that tournament a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I woke up the next morning and got like, you know, 21st place, blinded out, and I'm like, fuck, I was chip leader. <laughs> Me and my buddy, we make it all of this money. Yeah, I know it's rude to be bragging. They never catching a slack. Me and my buddy, we were Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Money. Thanks so for uh, coming on here. Yeah, man. Fireball in the morning. <laughs> you know what it is? Fireball? I'm like, oh. Yeah, well, he's having fireball and Coke. And like, I was like, well, I don't want Coke, really. <laughs> yeah. So I, got a little, I got some Patron and so soda water with a little Mio. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, welcome, people of the internet, back to another episode of the Table One podcast. Art Parman here, Justin Young, nice. co host, and uh, special guest today, the big Huny himself, Chris Hunichin. Thanks on the pod. Welcome. welcome. Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> it's Chris Unikin, by the way. It's Unikin, like unicorn. Yeah. Oh <laughs> shit. Well, you learn something I, new every day. I I, I could have stopped him, but I didn't want to. <laughs> Man, looks yeah, like you got a sick fucking setup there. You're just yeah. I'm gonna change. This is uh, not gonna be the aria <laughs> behind us. It's gonna we're gonna change it to a uh, fucking something just as sick as yours. We just want to compete a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is real life back here, though. This isn't a backdrop. It's actually what's really behind me. So. <laughs> So yeah, I, I just got through watching your store on Facebook. Uh, it was basically like a house tour. Is that your like a uh, consistent house? Is that like yours or is like an Airbnb like you guys like rent or what? what's the deal? No, so this is the town I lived in for seven, eight years or whatever when I was living in Costa Rica. So uh, my wife's family's here. Um, we come back when we can. But uh, this is just a house I rented while I was here. Uh, you know, I know the area pretty well and I know everyone in the town. So it's nice. We can find pretty nice places and get good deals and stuff. Just a quick break here, guys. Are you tired of playing with players like this? Not this. No, Like no. this? Or this? <laughs> or do you want to play with players like this? Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. If you like having fun at the poker table, Table One is the game for you. We play high stakes, no limit, 100-100 blinds. And if you want to get into the game, it's actually super easy. We have a website, table1.vegas. You just go to the website, you click get a seat in the game and fill out the form. It's that easy. It's your name, it's your phone number, it's the date that you're here, and I will personally reach out to you. And it's only 5K minimum buy-in. You know, run it up at 2.5 and join us. So uh, we'll get into this later, but I do want to tell the people out there also a uh, phenom ambassador. So like, I just, uh, you know, we point to phenom? it. We, phenom? This, <laughs> phenom. <laughs> this, uh, this podcast also supports uh, the phenom cause and, uh, hopefully it'll be coming out soon. Uh, but either way, I, I'm sure we'll touch on that a little bit later. I just want to make sure the no, audience get the, get the shell in early. I'm sure I'll throw an ad in here at some point, but guys, <laughs> there's going to be a link in the description below to sign up for the waiting list to get all sorts of special perks for signing up early. Yeah. <laughs> we'll figure all that later. All right. So, uh, normally in our podcast, we like to kind of go back in time a little bit and uh, kind of touch on you when you were just a little unicorn uh, growing up to be a big one. Uh, uh, I know we've talked about this before, but we're, we both grew up in North Carolina, uh, which is was kind of nice. Right. I, I know your, your bio says you were born in Columbia, South Carolina, which is pretty close. Uh, I was. Like, do you, I, you claim North Carolina or South Carolina? The world needs to know this. I was born and raised in Clayton, North Carolina. I lived in Columbia, South Carolina one year of my entire life. It was the worst year of my life. And for some reason, WSOP will not take down Columbia, South Carolina. It's where I'm from. It's the weirdest shit ever. I don't even know how they got that as their address because it was literally one year of my life. It was the most miserable year of my life. I want nothing to do with that place. And for some reason, they just attach it to me for, well, we're going on like 15 years now. So I don't know. But I grew up in Clayton, North Carolina. Um, I'm sure you were, I know you were in Raleigh at NC State for a while. Uh, so. Yeah, I went, I went to NC State, but yeah, I was, I was uh, raised in uh, New Bern. So oh, not too wow. far away from, yeah. That's actually where my ex was from, where, uh, you know, which kind of was the root of why Columbia was the worst year of my life. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, so I used to go to New Bern a lot. But uh, yeah, so Clayton's about 20 minutes outside of Raleigh. Um, I'm not, have you heard of it? being in Raleigh? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I mean, I, I was in Raleigh okay. for like five or six years. Yeah. I, 
Zebulon, fucking Carry. Like I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I know all those basically, I was like guys. Raleigh, Garner, Clayton. But yeah, yeah when I was growing up, people in Raleigh didn't even heard of Clayton. That's how small of a town it was. Now Raleigh's so big and overpopulated. Clayton's like the new Raleigh. Like everyone that works in Raleigh that moves there to work kind of just lives in Clayton and stuff. So. When I go back home, I'm like, damn, what happened in this town, man? It is not the same. It is blown up. But yeah, small towns don't stay small forever. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> I kind of felt that way yesterday here in Costa Rica when I was going through this town. I'm like, holy hell, this is way different than when I lived here. It's only been seven years. I, I got a text um, from a family member uh, after you won uh, your, your first bracelet. And uh, the local news, it was uh, WITN, I believe. And Gringo, uh, they yeah. had a piece on you. They're like a ECU alum wins bracelet, and they had like a nice little like a video clip, and then like a, a write up or whatever. But yeah, like uh, my family was disappointed it wasn't me. They were just like, oh, what, <laughs> why, why, why don't you get on there? Like, what are I mean, the odds? Is, is he better than you? Like, what, what's? Going on? <laughs> but yeah, so thanks for embarrassing me. I do appreciate it, even though like it's nice to get a little uh, shout out to Eastern North Carolina for uh, poker prowess. Yeah, for sure. You still got your chance. I, yeah, I wore the ECU jersey at the final table, so I. Uh, yeah, my buddy messaged me. He's like, man, your name is popping around here this past week. You're on every news station, forum, billboard, or uh, 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 what are they called? The, the Boneyard Banter. Uh, it's like uh, <laughs> Local celebrity, baby. <laughs> yeah, it was all over the place. So I was like, that's cool, man. Yes, yeah, I always love repping my college, man. It was great days. That's great. You had the fucking awesome summer, and we'll definitely get to that. But first, we want to go back in time yeah. to uh, – yeah. You know, when you had one of those computer monitors where you push it and it would go slowly turn on and then here comes Internet poker. You know, how, how did you uh, how did you find poker and gambling growing up? Did you play games with the family and and all that. Uh, that sort of seems like a pretty common story on here. Well, actually, when I was younger, uh, one of my best friends growing up uh, from my neighborhood, his name was Victor Rivera. I had like this little piggy bank. It was literally like a blue pig and have all my coins in there and I take it over to his house. Me, him, and his dad would play, like, five-card poker with, like, pennies, you know. And uh, we would just separate. We'd divide them up evenly, play, you know. We were, nobody was really gambling. We'd just play, and then at the end, whatever, whoever won, won. Uh, and that's kind of, my, I guess, my first experience with poker. But then I didn't really, you know, it was just for fun, something to do fun. Uh, but when I actually started playing uh, poker for real was in college, my freshman, sophomore year. I uh, started just playing like $5 sit and goes with my friends and stuff, you know, and we all kind of were just learning about poker. It was like the money maker days, uh, you know, two, 2000, uh, I guess 2003 was when I first started playing. Um, so this is my 21st year playing poker. So I uh, was just doing sit and goes and playing around for fun. And I was winning those with my friends and kind of feeling like, oh, this is a fun game, you know. And then I started dabbling with online where I was putting money on uh I don't know if you remember PokerRoom.com and Paradise Poker and, you know, a bunch of those old sites and Party Poker before it exited the U.S., stuff like that. Uh, you know, I'd load up one or 200 and, uh, you know, run it up five, six, seven hundred, feel like a boss, cash out 200, then lose it all like drunk one night playing cash games. And, and then, you know, that same repeated cycle over and over as many times as possible until you realize, hey, I should probably – change it up, do something different here and stop spewing off the money all the time. But yeah, I just kind of fell in love with the game then. Um, and then it just slowly developed into more and more. Uh, I started playing a lot towards the end of my college. Um, I knew poker at that point. I was playing tournaments. I knew poker was going to be what I wanted to do, but I didn't really have the results yet. So I uh, kept playing. My parents and everybody wanted me to get a job. I didn't have a whole lot of support with poker. Uh, people really didn't want me doing that. And um I decided to go get a master's at ECU uh, to buy more time, give me a couple more years to basically like, you know, show them that poker is, is what I can do. And, uh, you know, like I got my master's and it also gave me two, three more years to stay in college. And, and just really, I was just playing poker the whole time. College was just used to pacify your, your family, basically. Like it was just pretty much time. Yeah, my family plus my, you know, my ex uh, fiance and her family didn't really like it. A lot of my friends didn't like it. It was like a lot. I didn't have much support at all, honestly. Uh, my dad, my dad was like my my support back then. What did you get your uh, degree in? Uh, business. Yeah, I got business management degree, and then I uh, got the MBA, business administration. So, um, yeah, I mean, but I, you know, I've never used it to like a resume j to get a job. 
you know, but I've definitely used my MBA throughout my life for all the stuff I've done. You know, I've ran, you know, business myself and, you know, I have poker stables and I've had the crypto fund for a long time, the ICO fund and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So I definitely, uh, you know, I'm am, am happy that I did that. Um, you know, even though I've never been able to like say, Hey, I got this MBA, let me get this job because I have a master's, you know, but you know, who cares about that anyway? I've used yeah. the I've used the experience and it helped, you know, help me prove to them that I could do poker and, and I, you know, put, help put my brother and sister through college, stuff like that after. And then my parents were, were my, you know, starting to come around and, you know, my dad was always like, just do what you want to do, man. You know, like my dad had me hustling with him from an early age. So I, uh, he was always there, you know, and then he, he was the one guy I didn't have to convince. Everyone else was the ones I had to convince, but what were you hustling with him at an early age doing? What was his, uh, his deal? So my dad was one of the first ever power sellers on eBay. And uh, he, he pretty much, you name it, but if there was, if there was something big back in the day, he sold it, man. But the main thing was like Beanie Babies when they had that crazy phase, you know, he had all the top end Beanie Babies. Um, shout out to Justin Tinker. That was my dad's partner. I've recently reconnected with him. Uh, they, uh, you know, they were selling the biggest bean babies in the world. I'd go down, wake up 430 in the morning, Saturdays, go pack the car up with my dad with the glass cases, head out to the flea market in Raleigh at Dorton Arena. I know you remember that. The oh, flea yeah, market yeah. Out there. And uh, yeah, I was like eight, nine years old and I'm running around the flea market with my notepad in my back pocket. I'm going up asking about $500,000 beanie babies at nine years old getting the prices, going around the corner, writing down the Beanie Baby and the price in the stand, going to the next one. I'd lap the whole flea market, get everybody's prices, take them back to my dad. He would undercut them, and then we were killing it out there, man. He would just <laughs> undercut every, He would just be the lowest price out there no matter what. And so, yeah, he also he also set up his case. He did it right with the design and the cases, and a lot of people were just out there throwing them out there, and he had them, you know, looking professional. Yeah, you, you gotta keep them pristine, yeah. That's, exactly, that's man. Do, do you remember your dad's uh, eBay name by chance? Oh, uh, he had a few, but I think actually the one that was real big, I think, was the Bat Boy because that was my AIM name back back then. I think he took that one. We like yeah. to ask that question too. <laughs> yeah. That's great, and that yeah. that story about like early hustle and like Beanie Babies that's not not uncommon for like the successful people that we've interviewed, Brian Mycon. He was flipping stuff on eBay like he was one of the first people. He's one of the first people like putting money on E-Trade when his par parents were like, money on the Internet? I don't know, son. Yeah. <laughs> and just like just taking taking early shots and like being the first first just moving quickly. It seems to be a trick. Yeah, he, he somehow had a way to get a hold of everything before everyone else could. And I mean, he got sued about he got sued by Trike. He got sued by Oakley. He got, you know, he was hustling, man. He was doing it. But. He, uh, yeah, he crushed the game back then, man. He had a hair salon and tennis salon, so we had a setup at the tennis salon too, where he sold the Beanie Babies, the Pokemon cards, you know, all the all the stuff that were in fad. You Whatever know, was hot. Yeah. <laughs> so. Tennis salon slash BB Beanie Babies. Yeah. <laughs> For real, man, it was pretty wild, honestly, and it was right by the school too. So he got all kinds of traffic. I mean, he killed it, man. He crushed the game. That's awesome. That's that's awesome. He supported you the whole way through. Um, Kind of similar with my my father as well, for what it's worth or whatever. But yeah, just a little connection. Yeah, like everyone else kind of looked at me sideways because I had an engineering degree. They're like, "Oh, you're just set up for life. Why not do this?" I'm like, "Ah, yeah." <laughs> my dad, like, you, you get know, it. You know, what it's like, like you should just have fun. Like, whatever. It, and yeah, whatever. Just a quick break here. Have you ever checked out like a, the listing for Coachella or some other music festival, and you look at it and you're like, "Man, Kanye." I don't know a lot of bands, Eminem, how do they get all these people on here? Well, Phenom Poker has a list of pros, Joe Chong, Sergio Ido, Justin Young, Chris Hunichin. Brian Brass, Brass. Chris Hunichin. Uh, Eric Baldwin, man, it's a who's these, who. It's a who's who of guys who just support Are this platform and it hasn't even launched yet. And Table One is on that list. We support Phenom Poker. We think they're gonna do good things. It's gonna be the online poker site that you can trust. You can deposit with crypto. They're gonna teach you how to do everything. And the best time to sign up is right now before they launch because everybody who signs up to the waiting list is gonna get extra tokens, extra rake back. Uh, it's really gonna be in your best interest to sign up now. So just check in the description below, we're gonna have a link right at the top that says Phenom Poker, sign up through table one, get on the waiting list and sign up today. Super simple, name, email, and then you're on with us. But uh, either way, uh, 
so after the uh, MBA, uh, were you playing like pretty, like how many hours were you putting in like online during this time? Was it, was it more than you're actually studying or? Yeah, for sure. I was playing a lot because I needed a win because I needed results to like prove to them like this is what I'm going to do, you know? So uh, I started playing a lot, a lot, like my senior, junior, senior of college. And then through my MBA, I was playing too much really to the point where, you know, even that's a lot. That's one of the reasons my friends were probably off it too. It was just like, you know, let's go do this. Let's go do that. And I'm playing tournaments and stuff, but you know, I just knew I wasn't built to work in an office somewhere, you know, and like I was going to be able to get a good job and, you know, I would just sit there in an office, boss people around all day and stuff. So, you know, it wouldn't be the worst, but at the same time, like, that's just not my style, you know, it's not how I like to live. And, you know, I live pretty aggressively and I don't know, I was just sitting in an office all day in a suit and tie. just didn't sound, sound right to me. Y'all know, y'all know me, man. I show up in my slides and my gym shorts and my, my, you know, teach graphic tees. That's how I like to roll. <laughs> Yeah, not exactly okay. corporate attire. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, not at all. <laughs> so was it just pure success from uh, that time on? I mean, or, no, yeah. I mean, everyone has, you know, everyone has the roller coaster ride through it all. So I, um, what was your first big win? Cause obviously you had to swoop into the masters to like really prove yourself, but you were, you were feeling like, like you could figure it out obviously when you were, when you were graduating undergrad. But like there had to be like a moment in there when you when you had your first big like hit and you're like, OK, I could play some bigger stuff now. I, I'm almost there to like justify this shit to my family. Uh, well, yeah. What was your first? Do you remember your first score? Well, my first live score, my first five figure score. So I was uh, when I was in college, uh, ECU baseball, who they're still a very strong program. We're very pretty cool. much nationally ranked every year. But we uh we have a huge following there. Uh, they have what's called the, the jungle out in left field uh, where um, when I was going to school, they, they were just building the trees. Now it's a full out jungle. But, uh, you know, that's where everyone drinks and tailgates and parties and beer pong, shit like that. And the uh, the older booster guys there, they took me and my friends in pretty quick, man. Like, you know, they treated us like one of their own. They, you know, they had the sickest tailgate barbecue, you, you know, Carolina barbecue. A lot of people don't know what that's like, but. You know, they were set up, and it's the best, man. And so they uh, they took us in early and treated us like their own when we were all poor, you know, college kids and shit. So, uh, you know, I started, like, you know, seeing them every game. And then one of the guys, Billy Dunn, shout out to Billy Dunn, man. He's the first one to give me a chance out of nowhere. He came up and goes, hey, I see you've been doing pretty good online, uh, poker and stuff. And uh, have you ever played the World Series? And I was like, nah, you know, I've never been out there to Vegas. You know, it's something I kind of always want, you know, dream to do one day and stuff. And he was like, well, I'm going to fly you out, put you in, you know, put you up and uh, put you in the, one of the tournaments there, one of the 1500s, just give you a shot, see how you do. And then we can split the money or whatever. And I was like, oh, hell yeah, man. So I flew out. Uh, I was actually supposed to stay with one of my friends, Micah Hendricks, uh, back in the day. And he, uh, I got to Vegas. I had no money. <laughs> I had nothing. I yeah, call him like, hey, like you know, uh, need to get a taxi to your house. What's the address? Uh, he was staying at Panorama, and uh, I forgot who the guy he was staying with, but he was like, something happened. I don't know. He's like, man, he's like real tilted. Like something bad happened to him. I forgot what it was, but it's pretty brutal. But it was something like he got robbed or something financially. I don't know, something stupid. But he was just like, yeah, he won't let you stay here. And I'm like, what the fuck, man? I'm in Vegas. I don't know anyone. I don't have no money. And uh, actually, this kid from my college was out there. His name's Brandon Cashwell and he was good friends with Micah too. And he had known me just from like poker and stuff. And, uh, he was just like, yo, you can come stay with this is when Binion still had hotel rooms. And, uh, he's mm -hmm. like, you can come stay with me at Binion's. And at first I'm like, what the fuck, man? I came to Vegas. I'm going to stay with some random guy. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And, like, so I, you know, going to stay with him. Now he's been one of my best friends for 15 years, man. And we, we've, he's come out here almost every summer for World Series. Even before I lived out here, we'd come out here and meet together and stay for the summer and stuff. But, uh, yeah, it turned out we, you know, we were lived in the same college town anyway. So we ended up being all, friends all through the rest of college. And it's kind of crazy how that worked out. But, yeah, so I go there. I play this 1500. I get 31st, I think it was, for like 13.7K. Uh, and it was like the first live tournament I ever, you know, played that was meaningful. I had like used to go to Atlanta City and like win that little Taj nightly, at like yeah. start at midnight every night for like you know hundred twenty dollar buy in. It was like three k up top. Yeah, I won that a bunch of times, and it's not even recorded. Like it's not even like big enough to be recorded on Hidden Bob, you know. So, so yeah, that was like all the experience I really had. So to come out here in the first WSOP tournament, I was all hyped up to get like 
that kind of deep run. And uh, then Billy was like, hey, you know, play the next one too, fucking on me or whatever. So I played, I bricked or whatever, and then went back home. And I was like, I think it was 2000. I don't know, you have to check him tomorrow. I think it was like 2006. 2008, or, I believe. 2008. Yeah, so, I mean, that was like the start of it. And then that's when I realized, like, hey, I kind of, you know, this is fun, you know. And, and then I think my first, like, real – Final table score was when I final table the Millie Maker several years later at WSOP. I got like six for like 200 something. Uh, I won a Venetian bird at the very last summer of the summer for like 200 something. So I don't remember which one came first, but I think those were like my first first scores. I know that Venetian was like my first big live win. So sick. That's yeah. awesome, man. <laughs> so you, what were you playing uh, online at the time when you came out and got free rolled into the, the 1500 that you got whatever 13K for? Do you remember? Oh, that was the days, man. That's when we were grinding full tilt, uh, full tilt, and poker stars, and uh, the ten dollar, the eleven dollar rebuy. The, yeah, the ten rebuy, the fifty rebuy, the turbo hundo. Yeah. Oh man, I can't tell you how many times that was a DJ tournament. Yeah, bro, I would come home drunk because the bars in North Carolina closed at two, right? In South Carolina closed at two, so you know the turbo hundo was three a.m. start time. I would come home shit faced so many times and read that tournament. I won it a few times. I prayed a few times and I fell asleep with all the chips in that tournament a few times. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I woke up the next morning and got like, you know, 20 first plays, blinded out. And I'm like, fuck, I was chip leader. <laughs> what the fuck, man? Just pass out drunk, like mid tournament. Like so many times, like more than, oh, it's, just, it's almost shameful, but it's funny to look back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, shout out to my boy Pimpin' Yo too, John Fior, man. So he kind of, you know, I met him when I first started grinding online, and uh, he was from Raleigh. And uh, basically, you know, that through college, that's how we did it, man. We were grinding, and then when one of us would, you know, we, you know, back then we had our whole role and play on a Sunday almost every fucking time, you know. And anytime uh, one of us would go like completely bust on our accounts, we would just put the other ones in tournaments uh, until we hit a score, and then back on our own and. And we just kind of kept each other afloat when one of us was was down swinging, and so we we grinded out, you know, several years just you know keeping each other in the game. So I always have my respect for him. He was out here. He was actually on my rail. He flew out the night before. He was like, yeah, "I'm not going to miss your first bracelet photo, bro. Like, I got to be there." I was like, "Hell yeah, come on out!" So he came out, and uh, I ended up winning the tournament. Uh, you know, got real lucky and and got that wind off my back. So that was tight, man. He was here for that. And he ended up staying pretty much the whole summer throughout the, through the party. And, uh, yeah, so a lot of respect to him. Uh, he don't really play as much poker anymore, but you know, we'll, we'll always remember that he, you know, he did an interview with poker and he's like, I'm the one that discovered Hooney, you know, and everyone's like, what? And I'm like, man, he, you know, he kind of got a little bit of a point. Like he, you know, he, I wouldn't say he fully discovered me, but he definitely had a lot to do with helping me like get off the ground. So, so were you playing any like uh, home games as well during this time, or was it just like all online grind and then like every once in a while go to whatever Foxwoods or or Vegas or something? I would play some random cash games around town every once in a while. If y'all remember Randall Flowers, Randall in, uh, yeah, yeah. So he used to grind back in the day. He's not really in poker anymore either, but he knew it was some like random cash games around Greenville or nearby Aiden stuff like that, nearby cities and. Every once in a while, we go play some cash games there and stuff. But mostly, like, the home games would be just with friends, like, drinking and, you know, $10 sit-and-goes and stuff. You know, that was it for that. I wasn't really doing, like, anything to make money. You know, it was more to, to have fun with friends. But every once in a while, we would do these, like, random cash games, you know. But I never felt comfortable in these things, man. I don't know. It's just it's just sketchy vibes going to these, like, random houses. And, you know, poker was real illegal back then. I mean, even in North Carolina, I think it's kind of strict. But... Back then, like the the thought of a poker house getting robbed and or even ran up on the cops was just miserable. And then I, I like I don't know if you remember Mike Grox when he won the party oh, yeah. poker on the boat, like the first one. And he was at a poker game down in Raleigh or somewhere around Raleigh, one of the cities around there. I forgot exactly where, but you know I, I don't know if you remember when he got robbed and uh, they had a shootout at the door and stuff. And like you know all that shit just kind of steered me away, man. These these home games are always sketchy to me, dude. And now. Looking back, I'm like, I'm glad I had that that mindset because there's so much cheating allegations and mark cards and infrared glasses and stuff. I would back then I'd have never even had a clue about. So yeah, I, I think they were probably safer back then than they are now. I I played uh, I played the home game in Greenville. Like I went every Monday. I think it played Monday and Wednesdays. But I remember they 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 had a double lock system. It was a really nice uh, place. But like they had a door with a lock and another one with lock, and then like a, a bodyguard out front or a security guy. Right. 
And I was, I asked the, the guy that ran the game, I was like, well, what if they overwhelm the guard and they get in? Like, you know, like, yeah, like, yeah, I'm it ain't hard to, screwed. it ain't hard. And th the guy just looked at me and he was like, guys, everyone show your guns. And like, literally everyone other than me at the table literally put out a gun, had a gun in their fucking like pocket or like in their holster or whatever. And it was just right. like, good luck trying to rob us. And I was like, God damn it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was no slow one, rolls tonight. <laughs> it, it was, it was honestly, it was like, real. very. it was reassuring. And then like when I was driving home back to uh, Moorhead city, that's where I was living at the time. I was just like, that's kind of scary. Holy shit. <laughs> it was comforting yeah. in, the, in the moment, but man, <laughs> I'm the only one here without a gun. <laughs> I didn't know you lived in Moorhead city. That's cool, man. Yeah. I, I worked at Cherry point for like uh, three years uh, as an engineer. So like, Whatever. Went to NC State and then came back uh, closer to home and uh, lived there. Cool. Yeah, we had a beach house out in Emerald Isle. We used to go out there all the time and Atlanta City and stuff like that. So yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was that was my stomping grounds back in back in the day. Oh yeah. All right. Hang on a second. Oh, Art's gonna, I'm go. gonna get a refill. Yeah, I, I've always wondered if we ever like cross paths like in any of those games or anything. Like it sounds like no, probably, probably not. not. No, I mean it's possible maybe like once or twice like randomly, but I, I stayed away from the most part. But I'd go a little bit. Like if you ever played with Randall in some of them. Then it's possible. I, was I, I, I remember Randall once. I played with John Turner a handful of times, but like the other side was more the um, Chris Bell's. Uh, I don't know if you know him, but like, oh, like, good. I know Chris well. So you played in Biggie's game, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, I mean, yeah. I you know Biggie. I think Biggie died. Eh? Did you hear about yeah, that? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. That's that's unfortunate. I love Biggie. He was a great guy, man. He's, there, he's there was, a wild one. Yeah, there there was. I don't know. Like it was kind of cool to like see. Like I said, I, I did it for probably like two years or whatever, but like it was kind of cool to see like a handful of guys like go on to like have like nice success. Like, yeah, uh, I know Dennis uh, Ether is, you know, a little bit struggling now, but like whatever. He won a bracelet when I knew him like back in 2004 yeah. or five or whatever it was. I just thought it was the coolest fucking thing in the world. Mike Ross. Yeah, so. Gavin used to play that game some too. R.I.P. Yeah. Gavin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Randall, I, I don't know a lot of the guys you're talking about. I'm, I am from Virginia, so south adjacent. Uh, okay. But uh, but I Randall and I the first the first actually the biggest online score I ever had it was uh, it was heads up against against Randall and we uh, I think we chopped it and I can't even remember I think he was backed by Ryan Doubt at the time and yep. uh, and he was I don't know it was it was the one the two fifteen cubed it was my <laughs> my scoop victory online oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. the good old days when you could play a two hundred dollar tournament and. Uh, not pay extra money for the uh, for the add-ons and also you know win six figures. Yeah, yeah, those are the days, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I I miss I miss those days. I would I would literally work, and then just whatever. I'd go home, kiss my wife goodbye, and I would just like go off like uh, like once or twice a week. And like that's part of the reason I quit my job. Honestly, it was because like I was spending way too much time playing poker. Like I was working 40, 50 hours a week. And I was playing more yeah. poker than that. And it didn't leave a whole lot of room for, well, choose my girlfriend yeah. then, but like, you know, my, my future wife or whatever. So in my head, I was like, ah, I got to pick one of these. And <laughs> one seems like a lot My wife's going to stay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you got to pick two of them. One's got to be the wife, right? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is, is the second one going to be poker or engineer job, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I, I've, I've said this on the show probably a, a dozen times, but like, I literally made a list of like 30 things I wanted to accomplish before I, I went to my boss and I was like, I'm out. And uh, the first one was talk to Morgan, my, my girlfriend. And like, I was so nervous. And this is literally the, the night that I proposed to her. We, we went out to a fancy dinner and I, I, I sat down and I was like, so I'm thinking about quitting my job to play poker for a living. And before I could finish the sentence, she's like, let's do it. Let's go. And I was nice. like, oh. This is great. Like the ring is literally in my pocket. I'm like, oh, well, I'm giving this to her tonight. And this is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that's good reassurement right there for sure. It's nice to nice to have that validation. Yeah, that that was number one and probably the most important of all the thirty things or whatever. And like to like cross off the list because so if she would have looked at me sideways, then like you know I'd probably be like a happy, stable person in North Carolina right now. <laughs> what fun is that though, right? What fun? Is yeah, that? exactly. <laughs> like. I, I wouldn't change anything I've done. Like, and I, I imagine like every gambler kind of has this like kind of feeling, but like, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I wouldn't recommend this to anybody else in the world. Like anyone that I liked anyway, like I, no, I wouldn't sure, tell man. anyone to do this shit. It takes yeah. a special breed to, to survive this stuff. Yeah. Sure. Anyone who would sideways glance at like gambling for a living, definitely don't recommend it to them. because <laughs> They will just, yeah, no, I mean, if you look at all the top pros, I mean, you take out some of the young exceptions, like obviously like Jesse Lona and stuff like that, you know, but 
you look at all the top, top guys playing these high rollers and stuff. They all went through the grind, man. They all started back then. They all were playing small. They, they just been through it for so long, you know, and a couple of these guys definitely, you know, popped in late, young, like Ali too, you know, like, you know, started crushing pretty early and stuff. But most of the guys all went through that grind, man. They've all been through it, been through the ups and downs. You know, it's not like they just jumped into high rollers, started crushing, like put in their dues, you know? Damn right. Yeah. yeah it's a, uh... I don't want to say it, I don't want to say it's a lost art, but like I, I feel like everyone just wants success right away. Like right. just like any other industry, you just you just can't do it. And like I know Jesse Lonis is an exception, I suppose, but like yeah, it's, it's yeah. A, I mean he's well, just a sicko. Up, I love Jesse. The vanilla gorilla. That's that's his new nickname, by the way. I, <laughs> I coined it, and uh, he is definitely the vanilla gorilla. I like that. I like that. <laughs> that's funny. So you heard it here first. <laughs> Make sure you call him that. Retweet anytime you see it from because uh, I will be replying to his tweets and putting that in there more than I already have. Uh, actually, amazing. you know what's funny about that is I literally physically ran into him at the World Series this year. I was go it was on the final table bubble. I was like a couple of my buddies were and they said they'd wear the table one patch. So obviously I'm like, yeah, here. I, I run down there, I, I go to give these patches out and I'm like looking for the table number and he just like comes like barreling into me, hits me in the shoulder and I like, I like get moved like four yards from, from this guy running into me and I didn't know him, I, I didn't know him that at all and, uh, and he's just like, oh, I'm glad you're like a bigger dude because I could have really hurt someone else. Yeah, I could have just steamrolled right over you. Yeah, and then literally 10 seconds later he ran into me again. So, <laughs> oh, okay. Now yeah, it's getting so, uh, personal. <laughs> yeah, now we gotta now we gotta get the, small beef the gorilla on the pot. Yeah. Now we gotta <laughs> clear this beef. <laughs> no, he seems like a nice guy. I don't He's know. Great. He's great. Happy go lucky. Um, all right. So going back in time just a little bit. Sorry, we got sidetracked a little bit, but like, all right. So obviously you're a big online player. Had some success like live, but like uh, Black Friday, obviously hit all of us hard. But for people that were, I wouldn't call specialists, but like people that grinded super hard online, I can't imagine the the feelings like whatever for people like you and Sean Deeb and like, you know, whatever. There, there was just like the top like 20 players online were just putting such volume in. Like I can't imagine how like that kind of stuff hit you guys. That was crazy, man. I think I was playing 70 hours a week, 78 hours sometimes. Like, you know. The tank, too, was, like, during scoops and stuff, man. They would have all those tournaments, but then they'd have the, the tournaments that started at 3 a.m. for some reason, like, in the middle of the morning. But they were, like, good tournaments, you know? And it was, like, we weren't missing them, you know? So we were grinding all day, waking up, you know, 10 a.m., play till 10, 11 o'clock at night, go sleep at 12.30, wake up at 2.30, hop into 3 a.m. and do it all over and run the whole session through the whole day. I don't know how the fuck I was doing that, man. I know I'll be 40, <laughs> I'll be 40 in a couple of weeks, and – you know, I could do that in my twenties. I definitely can't do that in my forties. <laughs> so yeah. when when Black Friday hit, like, what was your plan? Like, is that why you end up moving down to Costa Rica, or like, what? Uh... Yeah. So actually, uh, you know, when Black Friday hit, all the top players had to move out of the country, and uh, I was supposed to go to Malta actually with like uh, Fick and Dykes and like Brian. I think it was Brian Coley and a few others. And uh, you know, I had my dog Callie. Uh, she was an amazing dog, Black Lab. You know, one of the smartest, if not the smartest dog I've ever met. Uh, and it was like a couple weeks before we were leaving, and the they hit me up. I was like, yo, the owner's saying, like, she has this little farmhouse in the back that the dog's going to have to stay in. And I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, they're like they won't let you keep the dog inside. Well, I'm like, well, I ain't, I ain't doing that. My dog's not a, a dog I'm putting out in some farmhouse in the backyard, you know? Like, it's not how she was raised. So, um you know, that fell through. And then uh, Joey Spanny met a guy at the poker table that was living out here in Coco. And I uh, was like, yeah, I can get y'all set up there. And I had only met Joey like once or twice, uh, but I knew uh, Chris Oliver days pretty good. And uh, I had knew David Iver some, and I didn't really know his brother Daniel yet. And uh, yeah, we all just decided, you know, like, hey, y'all want to move five of us move out to Costa Rica and try to grind online there. And we moved here to Coco, signed a six month lease, uh, left seven eight years later with a wife two kids and <laughs> <laughs> so i mean yeah i wouldn't take it back i had some of the most amazing times here man uh you know i have a you know this place has a big place in my heart i have the I have the pure vita tattoo on my chest like you know uh <laughs> so how's your spanish uh it's not that good anymore uh it was pretty good in the beginning it was it was decent i wouldn't say pretty good it was decent uh you know when i was first single and stuff was texting a lot with girls and stuff like i learned a lot that way but 
necessity. Yeah, once he got married and got settled in, and then we, you know, we had kids that, uh, you know, Spanish was their first language. So I was trying to like get them to learn English and you know talk a lot of English. And now my kids don't even speak Spanish. It's so disappointing. Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's her, like you know we're here right now with her family, you know, and half her family don't even speak English. So it's like. They're so they like can't stand it. They're like, how does Derek not speak Spanish? I'm like, I don't know, man. We we put him in Spanish classes for years. Well, his name's Derek. That's a good start. <laughs> yeah, but it's Derek Rodriguez. How's your girl like dealing with that stuff? Is, is she? Uh... I mean, she tries to speak to them in Spanish a lot, and then she'll make them watch like cartoons and stuff like in Spanish. You know, she's like, well, if you want to watch it, you gotta watch it in Spanish. And you know, but I don't know what it is, man. It's, the older you get, it's harder. You know, he's 11 now. The other one's seven. Uh, you know, my youngest kid was. He was one when we moved out of Costa Rica, so I don't really expect him to know Spanish. But Derek's definitely disappointed. He was four, which is still young, but that's when you learn it all, right? So yeah. Yeah. he'll come here and he'll he'll surprise me a little bit. He'll bust some out when they're talking to him, and, and you know he'll know a little bit more. But then sometimes he just freezes up, and I'm like, damn, bro, we gotta we gotta get him. But we're moving him to Alexander Dawson in Vegas. Uh, it's a private school, really good private school, and uh, they they do real advanced Spanish classes there. So I'm hoping. I'm hoping the next three, four years he's going to pick the language back up. So the memories will trigger, and he'll. he'll I'm hoping you so, again. man. I used to live in uh, Germany when I was like preschool. That's age a hard and, language. And I, uh, I've seen like home videos of me just like super fluent, just like that. really. Oh wow! And now I've, I, I wouldn't say I've lost it all. Like I could probably get my point across to somebody in German, but if somebody's talking to me and they're talking like pretty fast, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pick it up. Yeah, I went there when I was 12 with my grandma, and I was there for a couple months. And I uh, I started picking some up then, too, but that shit is hard. And then, you know, once you come back, you don't talk it, you forget it. Like, now I think I know, like, I can say 1 to 10 and maybe, like, three other words. <laughs> you know, like, you know, because my background is German. Unikin is German, you know. So, uh, okay. yeah, I don't know. It, it would have been cool, though. I really wish going back I would have just learned all the languages growing up. That would be super dope. Yeah. Just know. It's weird. Uh, if, you could, if I could talk to my, uh, whatever, 8-year-old self, I would – Tell them to learn how to play, play the guitar and learn another language for sure, because that would have got me so much fucking pussy. Hundred <laughs> percent, <laughs> man. That's the one thing you know. Like I'm connected with a lot of these musicians and stuff, you know, doing these parties and stuff. And just even in college, I used to throw a bunch of parties. But like I always have had that. That's the one thing where people are like, "What? What is something you could go back and learn that you don't know?" And it's definitely like music and playing the guitar, man. I always wanted to play the guitar. All right, well, let's talk about the parties. We open the we open <laughs> yeah. the box. Yeah, that's right. Chris uh, Chris has a famous Fourth uh, of July party that he throws every year. When was the what was the inaugural year? Yeah. Uh, well, I've been in my house three years. So I've owned three of them at this house. Uh, I threw a couple in my other house, but they were nothing like what we're doing now. They were still like nice, fun parties, but. Yeah, you're almost having like a mini like warp tour situation going on. You got, yeah, you got like artists, you got a bowling alley, you got a uh, hundred dollars at the door to get in, and you catch a lot of heat for for charging to get in. But like, given your NBA background, I, I get it. Like, you, <laughs> you want to? So I mean, it's money. not it's not even like you want to make money on it, but you you definitely don't want to like just fund everybody's fun. I'm guessing. So yeah, I mean, I for one, I've never made money on any of these parties. I've lost money i lost five figures on this party too and it's like i'm not in it to to make profit but i'm not gonna you know at, at first i was throwing them and not charging anyone anyway that's one reason i get a little shit honestly the people talking shit are just like a bunch of like people that are relevant though they're just people you know on twitter that have like 50 followers and shit like you know and then maybe every once in a while i'll get somebody that is kind of relevant that'll say something but it's very rare the people that go to the parties will tell you in a heartbeat like it's easy value like it's great value um but yeah i was throwing them on my own for a while and i was spending like 40 50k on these parties not charging anyone and then like you know well one i don't have it like i used to i got fucked over a couple times for some really large amount of money and some spots so you know for that's one but two it's like you know this party cost me like it was like eighty six thousand. i think i spent at the end and i end up uh you know i, I had 35k in sponsorship money and then I got around like 36K back uh, in sales. So like I ended up, you know, still almost 15K. Almost 15K. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and it's like, it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm like just running this party and making money at it. You know, that's not what this party is about. It's just, you know, the end of the summer, let everyone have a great time. I really can feel like I can confidently say no one can put on a party like I can. So, uh, you know, why not do it big? And and like, like I said, man, you ask the people to go to the party. There were 600 people there. I, mean, I asked them if, uh, 
you know, what they think about, about paying the money. Like it's easy. I would, I would pay the money in a heart. I'd pay double honestly for, for what's going <laughs> on. Like I you have, did. You paid, you paid 10,000. <laughs> yeah, <fuck, laughs> yeah. I paid a lot more and I put in hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of hours of work for that shit, man. Like it's hard, yeah. bro. It is hard. And not only like people don't understand the work that goes into it, even just finding sponsors, man. Like, especially these days where, you know, inflation is through the ro- roof and the economy's um, the economy isn't that great. Like finding people to give you, you know, free stuff and donate free money to a cause like this isn't easy. Right. So, I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And then now it's right in the middle of the series. I kept saying it's the last one because like, it's just so much work and I'm playing more, you know, the last couple of years I haven't been playing much poker and now all of a sudden I'm playing a full series, you know, I was going for player of the year and it was kind of distracting, but I had so much fun at this one. I think I'll, I'll probably have to do one more. If, I have to talk to the wife. She really hates these things. Like, uh, she gets, <laughs> you know, six. There was six hundred people in my house last year. We had nine hundred, so that was a shit show. That's a lot of people at, at your house. My kids are there, stuff like that. So, yeah. But I Has mean, anything. Uh, this is actually one of the. I, I told Twitter that we were interviewing you today. One of the questions was, "Has anything ever been like broken or stolen, or what, what's like the worst thing that's happened at one of these parties?" Well, so I, nothing's really been stolen. I don't really just keep stuff out that can get stolen, though, right? You know, and like, I mean, I, like, I don't have a dollar to my name in that in that house. Mm-hmm. I don't even keep money in my house really in general, just because, uh, you know, with a high profile name and a target on my yeah. back, being in crypto and stuff like that. Uh, you know, if I if people ever rob me, they can get some bowling balls and, like, you know, what I mean, like, what the fuck, you know, you ain't getting you ain't getting nothing of value. Maybe a fucking nice picture on the wall or something, but <laughs> some poker coaching, <laughs> some forced gunpoint poker coaching. <laughs> What do I do with these queens? Don't throw back to me. Yeah, <laughs> they exactly. say there's three ways to play Jackson. They're all wrong. Which way yeah. is right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. So I, just, you know, but I had uh, last year we had some damage with like the tile outside my door, um, which was pretty annoying. But like in the you know 900 people, you gotta expect something to happen. So you know, it wasn't the worst. It was something that I was able to fix, which is more money I have to spend. By the way, you know, like after the party. And, uh, and then this year, like someone like fucked up my dog gate, like where they like, uh, we have a little doggy door that goes to the backyard where they have like a little green area to, to piss on and whatever. And there's like a gate around it and someone broke that, which, uh, we didn't know about. So the next day when my wife let the dog out through the doggy door, it just immediately took off this little Yorkie and he's a little shithead man. So we spent, you know, 45 minutes chasing him around. Uh, but it's dangerous. Cause like, if he gets gone, he could just go right. You never know where he goes. And. I mean, those are you know, expensive dog. Like, you can't be just having this fucker running around like that. <laughs> but uh, my kids would kill me if that dog got lost. So, but other than that, yeah, not not too much. Uh, other than that, like, you know, I have a full full security team there too, though. So, uh, you know, they keep shit in check. They're watching the rooms. They're watching people try to go upstairs, stuff like that. I mean, they they keep the security team's amazing, man. I mean, they're they're great. So the negative's not that bad. So, without giving too much away to people, but like, what what's your favorite part? of this last year's party like what what event or what display i guess uh would would be your favorite part well so i think uh definitely the music is cool man seeing the different acts you know i usually had different genres of music coming in uh signal fires played i think six of my parties total now um because i used to do halloween and new year's also uh so sean the lead singer there was one of my roommates in college at ecu and, uh, you know, they've blown up. They, they used to be Fifth Generation back then. I'm not sure if you ever heard of them in our early college days. Uh, they did some Raleigh shows, too. But, uh, yeah, so they've blown up. They've gotten a big following just from my parties from out here, man. I mean, there's there's people I saw uh, Instagram stuff that tagging them at my party saying it's like their favorite band of all time and stuff, you know. So I think that's really cool, connecting them with new fan base. Um, and then another thing is like my friends from North Carolina, a lot of them fly out for the party, right? So I, they'll come out for a few days for July 4th, um, you know, and, I, and they'll hang out for a couple of days, go to the party and go back. But it's like, you know, these are people you think about it, man, like, you know, living away from all your high school, college friends, stuff like that. You know, how many more times in my life am I going to see them? You know, like you think about it, even I was thinking about that with my mom and my dad, like my mom's on the other side of the country. My dad died last year. It's like, I could see my mom less than 20, 40, 30, you know, times the rest of my life. Like, if you think about it, like, if I only see her once, twice a year, you know, how many years, you know, do I have? How many years does she have? So, so it's kind of like, man, like, if the party is something that, you know, gets me to see all my fucking friends that I never get to see that much, like, once a year, you know, like, that's kind of a another thing for me to, to keep them going, you know, it's like, you know, and like yeah. my friends, like I mentioned this in, in the chat, and they're like, "Oh, we, you know, you ain't got to have a party for us to hang out." I'm like, "I know," but 
the point is, it's it makes like, it easy. I mean, but it sure. makes it easy, right? Like it gets. Oh, I got some trash behind me. It makes it easy uh, to get everyone together, you know. And it's a cool event, and it's a cool week, and we do a bunch of cool shit too, you know. Like we all went to UFC one time, you know. We just, you know, they all went to the. Uh, I was in the main, but they all went to the 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 show at the Sphere, the Dead Show at the Sphere. Okay. They all oh, Dead Company, yeah, yeah. Sick. Yeah, so it's like you know, everyone gets to come out here, and we all get to see each other, and even they don't get to see each other a lot, you know. Some of them are living up uh, in the north now, and they're all in different towns. Everyone's kind of going their own life. So we get all get together, you know? And so I, I think that's, which is weird, but I think that's one of the coolest parts about the party for me is I could see all my, my best friends from back home that I just hardly ever get to see. Yeah. That makes me think of the, have you ever seen uh, do you know what wait, but why is it's no. a, it's like an online comic strip. It's not, I mean, it's, it's cool, but they, he has this one blog post that he did where it's like uh, the amount of times that you see like your, your best friends, in high school, it's like you see them three times a week for four years or in every day in school and all that. And then your parents, you see them almost every single day until you're like 15, 16 and you get a car and like, and then after that, it's like a big calendar where it's like, you might see them at first like once a week and then you'll see them like, and, and then you get to our age and it's like, you know, you might see them, I don't Twice know, 25 more times yeah, right. before they die. That's okay. like, that might crazy. be it. So crazy when, I have, when I have friends come to town, I try to make time to see them more because I think of that. I'm like, damn, this might be like one of the last 15 times I see this person that doesn't live here, you know? So I appreciate, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can appreciate that part of the party being powerful yeah. for you because it, it is a powerful thing. So everybody out there that has uh, high school friends and uh, family that you've been neglecting, call them, you know? Yeah, yeah for sure. The day before the party, I had uh, took a bunch of my friends around. Like they, you know, they hadn't been to Vegas in a long time, and uh, we just, you know, went through like the winds, walked around shops and stuff, and Bellagio. You know, just took them around. They were calling it the Hooney Tour, you know, in Vegas and stuff. And like he had messed me after, and he's like, "Man, like you don't understand how much we appreciate. Like we know it was the day before the party. You have all that shit on your plate going, and you took the time to take us around Vegas." And so I'm like, "Bro, you know, like that's." It's kind of the same thing. Like, how many times are we going to get to hang out? I'm going to make time for you no matter what I got going on, you know? So that was real cool uh, that we got to do that. And, it, you know, he acknowledged after. He's like, man, like, you don't understand, you know, how much we appreciated that. I'm like, no, it was fun. I had fun too, you know? Like, obviously, I walk through these casinos all the fucking time. So it's, like, not, like, <laughs> the most fun thing for me. But at the same time, it's cool to, like, show them around and, like, let them enjoy it and stuff. So, yeah, it was a good time. Um I was going to say one more thing. Oh, about your about your friends and your your rail. I was going to say, it seems like – you have pulled <laughs> some people from from your past and they've stuck in your circle. Like a lot of people's rails, it's like, you know, guys on laptops uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. running the Sims. But uh, but when you look at your rail, it's a uh, it's a lot of that's the way rail should be. But it's a lot of hoonie types. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think I think it was Shulman. Uh, he he uh, named my rail the Hoon Platoon. <laughs> and uh well so, yeah i mean i i think that my rail is the best rail out there by far i know poker all the poker guys were saying that that 100k tournament was the most insane final table of all time that the rail was insane the the number the viewers were outrageous like you know i had so many people come up to me in the hall I was like you have no idea me and my wife are screaming at the uh tv for you we're rooting for you and stuff like so many people i'd never met so that was cool man like the vibe was insane it was so electric you know, obviously the runouts were made for TV. You know, like the ace shack, the fives, turn ace. I just remember the five. Uh, every single person that got it in at the final table got it in bad, won the hand. So it was just, it was crazy, man. It was crazy. That pre that pre handshake with Osmus where you tried to you tried yeah, to send line, the though. jinx. <laughs> you tried to send the jinx, and he's like, "I'm not falling for that." And then it came anyway. That was yeah. fucking incredible. Osmus, this is your day, huh? Yeah, I guess so, buddy. Drops a now, big hold on. Hey, quick nice. wow. one to come. Over things. Look at Odie. <laughs> Premature hug. Smart. Claude did it to me last year, man. Claude did it to me last year. Oh! Oh my goodness! So yeah, like I actually want to know this. Like when you were when you went in for that, did you make any kind of physical contact with him? Because like you could tell think... the camera. It looks like you get really close, but like maybe, maybe not. So he like tried to back up, and I'm pretty sure I grabbed in and just like touched him anyway. I like grabbed his yeah, arm. That's it. Time, that's you know? it. Like, that's yeah, fucking yeah, why, yeah, right yeah. there. I knew it. Yeah. I knew you made contact. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and then on the final hand, when I had the nine seven against Jax on the nine high board, and on, on the yeah. turn, I had to give the pro speech play. You know, I was like, I can't believe I'm about to get second in another one of these because I had second in two World Series already. I've already yeah. lost heads up twice. So I was like, I can't believe I get second in another one of these. Well, you know, yeah. 
got to fucking pull out all you the live tricks at that you point. You might as man. well put the backpack yeah. on at Back that point, like, walking yeah. away. Yeah. All right, guys, well. just let me know if I win. I'll, yeah. I'll be in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, that's that's a that's a good veteran move right there. Uh, but yeah, like I, I I know Art and I watched it. We we had it on uh, during our game. We basically had it on every TV because it was one of the more entertaining uh, final tables I've ever seen, or certainly one of the most memorable. That, that's for sure. Like, yeah, I, for sure. For for such a large buy-in for like drama and actual fun and like banter, like I don't know, like I, I just don't expect that anymore in in today's hundred Ks, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. A lot of times, it's just dead atmosphere in there, you know. And and I mean, honestly, the rail, I think it really gets in the heads a little bit. I mean, I could see Osmus was a little dizzy, you know. And like, I even asked him one point, "Is like, the rail bothering you?" He's like, "You know, it's it is what it is. I I think it's a cool thing that you got so many people supporting you." He goes. But if you ask me if I could do without it, like, yeah, I'd rather not have it, you know. And, <laughs> and Isildur seemed a little uh, shook by it, too. And then he had that misclick, you know, and oh, ex- yeah. which ended up fucking me. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, you know, I, I played with him in 250 the next day. And I was like, hey, man, like, you know, sorry if the rail was, like, too much for you and stuff. He's like, no, nah, man. He goes, I, I love that people were supporting you that way. And, you know, he's known me a long time, too, you know. So he was like, no, nah, I love that. You know, he's like, it didn't bother me at all. I was like, you sure? I was like, you look a little dizzy. He's like, yeah, it's just in the moment. You know, it's, it's aggressive. But he was like, no, nah, I really love that for you, and I love that for the game, especially, you know, he's like, you know, it makes it fun for people watching and stuff. Like, if it's a live stream, right? The whole point of a live stream is so people are watching it. And, you know, how much fun is it if, if it's boring? There's no – it's just auto-tune, and everyone's tanking 30 seconds, you know, for decision. And <laughs> – like whatever let's bring some fun to the game you know and hell yeah that's right if i, you, I if picked you up pull, a lot of fans uh, sorry i was gonna say if you uh if you pull one guy who's like on the country club website about to put in his deposit and he's like you know what i might take up poker instead <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, for the sure, fun man. factor then it then it's positive outcome for the whole sport the whole game of poker sport might be strong but yeah, yeah i know no no it's it's I don't know it's i i feel like i've been preaching it since i, I got into poker you know 25 years ago like it's it's a game. It's supposed to be fun. Like, you know, obviously we're trying to take each other's money and like, that's, that's a whole separate thing, but like, you're supposed to win or lose. You're supposed to enjoy yourself the entire time through. And that's, that's all that matters. I understand serious moments are serious, but 99% of poker should be absolutely fun. And like getting to know your neighbor talking, I don't know, shit like that. (laughs) Having a great rail like that. Definitely. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I'm sure everyone that is watching probably knows, but uh, Chris had one of the best years, uh, certainly this year. I think you finished like third or fourth in the POIs this year. I'm not trying I think to... I got bumped down to fifth at the very end, yeah. Uh, Racer oh, sure. had like okay. a real sticker on there at the end, and Chance won Let's... that bracelet. So One of, one of the sickest uh, World Series ever, in my opinion, anyway. One of the more memorable, anyway. And like part of the reason it is more memorable is because you didn't have any bracelets coming in, and like you're, you've always been in – whatever, the top 10 list of best players without a bracelet. Um, like, how, how motivating is that for you every year? Like, I mean, this year is probably a little bit different because I know you played everything, but, like, like, do you come in every single, like, World Series, like, I need a bracelet, or is it just, like, if it happens, it happens? Yeah, I mean, so, to be honest, I hadn't really played a lot the last four or five years World Series. I um, Last year was going to be my first full series in, like, four years. Um, and I came in, and I had two really deep runs right away. And... Um, then my dad died, of course, and I didn't cash another tournament the rest of the series after my dad died. And, uh, you know, that was some of the, the hardest times I, in my life I've ever gone through. Um, then dealing with all that Doug Polk bullshit, like right when my dad died and stuff didn't help. But, um, you know, so this year I, I wasn't sure I was going to play, honestly, the World Series. I uh, was going into it. I was working really hard, doing a lot of crypto stuff, and I was spending a lot of hours a week. And... Mm-hmm. Um, was up till 5 a.m. every day. So I was just like, I'm not even really on a poker schedule either and stuff like that. And then, I don't know, I just, like, had a deep thought about it. It was like, man, like, I got to win a bracelet for my dad. Like, I don't know how much more, more I'm going to be focused on poker. And, um, you know, two years ago, I, I got third in that 250K. But I uh, I I only played three tournaments that summer. You know, it was I wasn't even going to play the 250. It just a bunch of people hopped in that it, I was like, okay, this tournament's gotten pretty good. So I sold some action to some friends and stuff real quick, and I hopped in. And, yeah, poker wasn't really a thing. You know, when I started OTC Trade with my friend, you know, I was focusing on that. Um, I wasn't really playing poker at all then. And then, you know, we we had that going for a couple years uh, before we shut that down. And I don't know, poker's kind of been on the back burner for me for a solid five, six, seven years now. I just kind of play here and there. Um, so it was really nice to get that that 
uh, monkey off the back. I, uh, I don't, you know, it was a lot of pressure, I guess. Like one, like I got to the point where it's like, I really want to win a bracelet for my dad. And so I'm just glad it's over. Now I can go back to just playing when I want to and stuff, which, you know, it's kind of what I was doing anyway, but this summer I was, you know, I wrote that Facebook post basically it was like, yeah, this is, I'm going to go hard this summer. I'm going to give it my all and, and try to just bring one back for him. So I'm glad I manifested that. I'm glad we did it. I'm glad that, uh, that's out of the way. And, you know, I mean, I had a good time this summer and, you know, being a no limit player, not playing the mid games, top five POY is like a huge accomplishment. Um, it's pretty, pretty fucking hard to do. And, uh, you know, obviously winning would have been amazing. Uh, and I had a shot too, you know, I just, I got, I ran pretty bad at the end of the series in some really big spots. You know, we're not going to go into those. I'm not allowed to complain, obviously. You know, I cash for, <laughs> cash for like five and a half million or whatever this summer. So, so yeah, but uh, I think that, I don't know. I, I might start playing more poker again. It really brought the itch back. Um, you know, obviously the confidence is through the roof. Um, I, uh, I got a little more like leeway now where I can travel and stuff. So I think, uh, might try to hit some tritons or i might go to cyprus i might go to barcelona i'm not really sure yet but i uh you know i'm in the spot where i can pretty much do whatever i want so you know options are in the air but i definitely want to get back into playing more i mean at one point i was kind of thinking like man you know i stopped playing for two three years it's like i obviously have like some talent for this game i've always been a profitable player since even the early days and so i was just like why why am i going to waste this talent you know just to do other stuff that you know, isn't, you know, fulfilling, but poker is a grind, man. And when you get in that grind mode, it, it's not as fun. So just keeping that balance of having fun, but also like, you know, taking it serious. If you find that median, it's, you know, it's one of the best things you can do if you're good at it. For sure. And like, uh, in all honesty, like, I, I think run good is a real thing. Like it's, it's not some fake thing or whatever. Like when you're, when you're have a couple of results in a row, and your mind is just so focused and clear as opposed to like questioning like, oh, should I do this or this? Like when you're running good, it's the, the decisions are easy. It's, it's not right. even like a big deal. Like it, and like, it's, it's a real thing. Like I, I personally, I, I think you should like fire everything you can until you get sick of it or tired of it or, you know, just have a, yeah, I'm a big, or whatever. big believer in momentum. And, uh, yeah. you know, I try to, with my horses and stuff, preach that too. It's like when you're winning, keep playing, like don't take yeah. A lot of people win and they want to take time off because they just got financial money and comfortable. And I'm like, no, this is the wrong strategy. Play until you stop winning and then take some time off. You know, like right. the momentum, the heaters are real, man. Yeah, well said. Well yeah. said, both of you guys. As, <laughs> yeah. uh... No, I, yeah. I mean, I've had a few in my life and like I, there's just no better feeling in the world. Like showing up and just knowing you're going to win. Like even if you don't win, like you just still you show up. You're like, I'm winning this. Like, like you, whatever yeah. flip you get into, you're like. Good luck, buddy. You're 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 not you're not hitting this. Like you're there already is, thinking about the next hand <laughs> after you double up. Like it's just like it's, there it's was a point perfect. in time where I knew one out of a hundred multi-table tournaments that I entered online, I was going to win. I was like, these are just the stats. This is what I've been doing. I mean, it's going to happen. So I didn't win this one, but I mean, I'm only 99 away from another victory. <laughs> yeah, even coming to that 250, that was the day after the 100K win, and like I right. played pretty That's bad sick. the first day. Like that was probably the worst poker I've played in years. Uh, and I bagged like half a starting stack, which still fortunate to be in. Showed up day two, and honestly didn't feel like I was playing my game at all either. And then I had this weird hand with Showman, which you know I, I love Showman. That's my boy, man. But I know he was pretty dizzy at me. But there was like a weird hand where the small blind like thought, didn't see me raise, so he was like either forced to forfeit or call. He had put in like you know one blind, and I'd put in like you know, two two point two or whatever it was, and he ended up calling, and then Showman called, and then. It was, I think I had King 10, it was Queen 10, 9. And like spot where like sometimes, you know, I'll mix between C betting and checking. And I decided with the small blinds range of being so wide because he didn't see me raise, I was just going to bet. And then I bet. And then he like kind of like did this before calling, like, fuck, why am I in this spot? You know? So and then Showman raised. And I was just like, this is just such fucking fuckery here because like all, everything that just went down, you know? So like this hand, I ended up shoving actually. Which is something that you just I would never do, right? And uh Jeez, Showman yeah. ended up like yeah. side calling off. He had like Jack Five of Hearts, so he was Queen Ten Nine, two hearts. So he just had like yeah. the opening in the flush draw. And he when he saw my hand, he was so fucking breathless, man. Like yeah, he was and then I just turned to Jack for the straight, helped baited the flush draw, and it was, ended up being a pretty big pot. And then we went on break after that, and that's kinda when I was able to settle back down. You know, I was on such an emotional high 
and like such a rush and I was exhausted. I still didn't have my voice back at that time. My voice was gone, you know, and I was tired, man. I was, I was exhausted. And, uh, but I went on that break. I did an interview with like poker org or something. And I actually had like talked about the exhaustion and then it kind of said, I was like, all right, well, you know, we know what's going on here, but let's get back to the game plan. And, you know, you got to man up in these spots. Right. So I think that's when I started playing like good poker again. So I got lucky to fade out the, the bad, the bad poker, which, you know, it, you know, I try to take pride in not ever playing bad these days and especially in the big tournaments. But, uh, you know, I was glad to get that out of the way and still be in the tournament so I could, like, you know, jump back on the saddle. And then, you know, getting third was, was insane. I was one river card away. If I hit that river card, who knows what could happen. You know, uh, going back to back would have been insane. Yeah, and those yeah. two tournaments. That is historic. It was historic. sick that uh, Jeremy was there, too. I mean, I know the yeah. fields aren't huge, but, like, you both – Ran yeah. deep the very next tournament, confidence high. It's just like yeah, and deep. like sand are not huge. It's, they're not huge, but man, like the hundred K, I think it was one hundred twenty-seven runners or something, and then the two fifty got over a hundred. It's like it's still pretty impressive, you know. The final table, the two biggest buy-ins, you know. And I mean, he had what? How many final? He had me. He had eight final tables or something ridiculous. Like, like yeah, I think yeah. I had twelve dashes. So like, what the fuck? Yeah, but, like, but we figured it out. You're better. You know, you won, you beat him. <laughs> I mean, he had more player of the year points than me, though. So yeah, he's a mixed and he's got, yeah, and he's, you know, got, some of he's got like shit, five though. more bracelets than me, too, so, <laughs> or whatever it is. Some of them but, are yeah. online bracelets. They don't count. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Austin is, man, he's a class guy, man. He's a stand-up actor. He's great for poker. He's, he's a great to play with. If you go back and watch the stream, too, like when I rivered that five, he smiled, you know, he laughed about it, you know, and like and when I was trying to handshake him early, he's, you know, he's going along with it, like, oh, no, 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 but he was like having fun with it, you know, and, yeah. and even when I river the nine for the bracelet, uh, he said, I heard, I remember when the nine, he, he just goes, damn, <laughs> like, but, you know, he was like, cheer, he was smiling, he wasn't down, he wasn't, you know, it's his, his table manners and presence and everything is just amazing like he's great for the game so he is he both he both of us go pretty far back with with jeremy one of the first people that i met when i moved out here when i started playing slightly higher stakes uh good dude good dude yeah, yeah. I hate to say it on yeah, the internet about him but he's no, all right. we, we have this running bit for the last couple months how much we hate jeremy osmus because he's just good at fucking everything it's really it's That's really great. annoying it's so annoying <laughs> yeah. but uh no i actually do like him <laughs> yeah, I have to say it with like a. a Sorry, you have to admit like, that today, but. <laughs> so what's what's in the future for Big Uni? Are you gonna uh, are you gonna fire off all these Tritons? Oh, actually, before we get there, I was gonna ask uh, just because we like to talk about uh, exactly how much money people have on this show. Did you uh, piece out for the uh, did the for the next the two fifty or did you yolo it all, on in there? Oh, oh no, yeah, I, I I piece out for sure. Yeah, so like you know, one thing that was a little bittersweet about that is uh, because I haven't been playing as much. My kids are getting older. You know, you try to be a little more uh, smart with your money and stuff. Like back in the day, I used to just fire it all in all the time, you know, and try to get older, more wiser, try to be smart. So, like, I obviously had less percentages now than I would have had, say, four or five years ago. And that part's a little bittersweet because I used to fire pretty hard. Like back in the day, I'd have, like, you know, at least 40% of myself and stuff like that. And um, so I had less, yeah, I had less in both. Um, and it's still, you know, I put a lot of money in my pocket, can't complain, you know, still, still put, you know, more money than a lot of people make in, in a, several years. So I'm not complaining, but it definitely is a little bittersweet. It's like, of course, like the summer where I'm like trying to be a lot more, uh, you know, strict with the role and stuff is when I have like the best summer ever, you know, it's just kind of, <laughs> whatever it is maybe it is. maybe that was a function of that maybe you had got more uh confidence to make make certain exactly. plays because you had less to worry about if you busted i feel like anyone that's ever been anyone that's ever been back before and goes on an upswick uh, uptick or whatever always has that feeling of like ah, i should have just done this myself but at the same point like playing not only for yourself but for the people that believe in you like i feel like there there's an extra not a burden but an extra weight attached to where you're like Okay, let's not fuck off this hand. Let's, let's sure. buckle For down sure. and like figure this out. Yeah, I hate losing other people's money, man. I hate losing other people's money. So it definitely is like makes you want to try a little bit harder for sure. And yeah, I don't know. I uh, I don't know what's going to be next. I'm in Costa Rica. I just got here for a vacation with my family and some of my friends and stuff. So we're here for two weeks. Uh, come back to the town I you know I lived in for so long, grinding online and stuff. So we're just going to be chilling. Um, then the kids start school and then I'm going to kind of map it out. I was thinking about maybe going to Cyprus for this 300 K super high roller bowl. 
Um, it's a lot of travel though. I, I hate traveling and, and actually on the plane ride here and stuff, it was, you know, what, three and a half hours of Houston and four hours here, four and a half hours here. And I'm like, if I, this is annoying, man, how the fuck am I going to travel for 20 some <laughs> hours? To Cyprus? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, fuck man. Uh, so I don't know. I might go eat. I love Barcelona. Um, you know, but that's just like the timing is kind of weird with me with my kids and their sports and their football and stuff. So. Yeah, I'm not sure, man. I might just settle back in and just keep doing what I've been doing, chilling, keeping up with their sports and going to all those games and shit like that and just saying fuck poker. But <laughs> who knows? I don't know, man. I, it's, I'm going to let this two-week vacation kind of just play its part and then just kind of decide from there. Anything uh, non-poker, like uh, business-wise? I know you said you had OTC trade. You shut it down. Uh, you working on anything business-wise that you could talk about? Not really, no. Mostly, uh, you know, I have still have some people in my stable that, uh, you know, I'm working with daily on hand history, stuff like that. And then uh, I've been doing a lot of crypto farming stuff. So um not sure if I'll keep doing all that or I don't really know what I'm going to do, man. It's uh, turning 40. I might just retire. Well, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> say retire. Coach. Speaking online, I mean, you are an ambassador of Phenom Poker. So like, <laughs> we're going to need yeah. you to be around for a little bit longer to like carry the torch. For sure, for sure, yeah. Can't have little people like me like trying to pretend like we were we were good at poker or anything. Yeah, I do have some obligation there. So yeah, I mean, I, I see myself still playing. I mean, I, I definitely got the itch back. Um, it's just a matter of the semantics and traveling and the timing and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I know there's a Poker Go series. I think in September, I'll probably dabble in those. You know, stuff closer to Vegas is always easier. Uh, maybe I'll go down to Bahamas. Uh, for the WSOP Paradise stuff. Uh, I don't really like how they, they overlap it with the entire win series this year. And yeah. I don't really know what they're – I don't I don't understand the beef here. Like, if all these operators work together, man, it's just so much better for the game. Like, I don't know why we're beefing with each other. It's just so fucking stupid. But, yeah, I don't know. I love the Bahamas, though, so I love going down there. Um, I don't know. It's just one of the, my favorite trips. So I might still get down there instead of, of playing at the win, and we'll see. To be determined. Depends how long the flight is. Yeah, right. I know. <laughs> Shit, that's that's another one. It's about the same as Costa Rica, you know. It's like, fuck, man. <laughs> Unless we fly private. We could fly private, but then Doug Polk would be blasting the whole internet about the comeback I am. What's the, what's the fly? You should walk what's, there. Yeah, it's, what's it's, the fly private beef? I don't really keep up with. I saw you, uh, him talking shit to you and you guys replying. And I, honestly, I don't really, I'm, I'm on Twitter a fair amount and I still don't know. Outside of the, the GoFundMe drama, which I was just like, eh. He's just retweeting a GoFundMe, you know, whatever. Yeah, but. that was so, that is just so stupid. It's like that thing raised six thousand total, and three thousand of it was from my friends in the poker community. And he asked, like, I'm like scamming people. It's like these are my friends who I've done a lot of shit for, who's just giving back to my help my family, my mom and my sister. Like, I live in the West Coast, they live on the East Coast. They said I didn't even know about the GoFundMe until I had a couple thousand dollars raised, you know, and. And then they basically just wanted, like, you know, I support everything in my family financially and shit. I've been doing it for a long time, and. And it's like, they, my dad just died, man. They knew what I was going to do. They just wanted to fucking help out somehow. You know, they just wanted to feel like they were helping too and not just putting all the burden on me because I had to do all the funeral process. And, you know, it's not even just about the money, just the process too. And they just wanted to help, man. And then they raised a little bit of money and was like, can you share? And I, I told them no at first a couple of times. Like, this, this is just going to cause drama. Like, people aren't going to sign it. And then, you know, it's, they just kept saying, like, please, you know so many people, and, like, you know, you have so many friends that will help, blah, blah, blah. It's my sister. Like, so my dad, my sister was living with my dad. My sister, oh, um, shit. Yeah. yeah, and she has a, he is five now, I think, five or six-year-old kid. Who, she's a single mother. The dad's never been involved. He's an autistic kid. It's a very hard thing to do. My sister, she's had her own troubles in her life. She was in prison for a little while, and. You know, she's changed her life around big time. You know, she got into some drugs and stuff, and she was really rock bottom at one point. And uh, so she moved in with my dad, and she changed her life, man. She's clean. You know, I sent her to rehab. And, um, you know, and now her kid's, like, the main part of her life. And, and, you know, I don't think people realize how fucking hard it is to raise an autistic kid, especially on your own. And so she, uh, you know, depended on my dad a lot. They both did. And so when my dad died, it was crushing for them. And the house that he was in is the house I grew up in as a kid. And, you know, it was run down. It had been needing fixed up for a while. My dad was just a stubborn motherfucker, man. And, you know, these older guys, they just don't want – they don't want you to interrupt with how they're living and shit, you know. So, 
you know, I think somebody I saw a tweet. Someone was like, "Do you want to know why the house needed fixing up once he died, but it didn't need fixing up before he died?" It's like, where do you come up with? The, you know, what, what makes you think that it didn't need fixing up before he died? It just when he died, it was just you know, my sister needed to live there and shit needed to be done, and she just wanted some help with it. And yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, like Doug knows that money is so irrelevant to like the stakes we play and the money that we do and everything. You know what I'm saying? Like I spent 15k on a party. Like you don't think I could have spent three thousand dollars to help my sister out? Which I which I ended up putting about 20,000 into that house for what it's worth. You know, it's like, it's not like I ain't doing my part. You know, it's just like, they just wanted to fuck. She just wanted to feel like she was helping, you know, and the way he takes these stories and run with it and tries to bully everybody. It's fucking comical, man. And, you know, and I, what he does, is he tries to bully people to play him heads up. Cause he knows he's one of the best heads up player. Like yesterday, it's like, dude, if you want to cross book in any tournament series, let's go. And he's like, oh, why do we need seven other people at the table? Let's just play heads up. It's like, bro, we all know your strategy, man. We know what you're doing. Like, you know, calling me a grifter, bro, like, give me a fucking break. No one does the, what I do for people, man. Like, you know, you ask all my friends and shit, man, I'm the most generous fucking guy in the poker community out there. Like, so he, he knows what he's doing, man. He knows he's full of shit. It is what it is. Unfortunately, yeah, just being nice uh, doesn't get you a whole lot of clicks. It's, uh... it's just funny because he's calling me a grifter, but, like, he, he's really grifting the community. He's taking his community – and he's feeding them bullshit so that they attack people and you can give him money, right? Like, this is how he makes his money now. You know, he runs his little card game and he fucking does his YouTube shit where he attacks people and has all his little minion followers. You know, he's making so much money off them and they're like just worshiping the guy whenever he's just owning the fuck out of him. It's kind of funny. And, like, you know, I'm blocking 50 to 100 fucking people a day on Twitter who's got like 12 followers, 15 Jesus. followers. Like, can't even tell you how many burner accounts have been hitting me up. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just funny to me. It's like, dude, go get a life. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I fucking, my life, my life's great. Well, I'm glad while you were, uh, while you were blocking people, you found that found the time to DM us to, to, <laughs> to get, yeah. get the communication going to get the, get this. Yeah. After yeah. the win, I had a lot of people reach out for podcasts. So I, you know, I was saying like, at, once I, got done with the series and I got to Costa Rica. I was going to spend today. I just did one with Jeff Gross. I'm um, doing one with Holt Naylor. I'm not sure if you know who that is. He was a quarterback uh, for ECU and he went and oh, played yeah. with, Fuck yeah. with the Seahawks for a little bit. So no, we're going to do one of those uh, with them and then one with Pirate Radio, I believe, or the Boneyard or something. So yeah, I'm going to knock them out. And- well, sick. If you um, if you have any like links you want to send me after they get done, I'll sure. put them in the description of this too so people can, if they didn't catch a different part of the story they want to hear, then they can, uh, they can check. Yeah. That I'll out. probably do those the other yeah, two, so. uh, after the trip. And then I did the, I just got done with the Jeff gross one before this. Some of this is recycled. I end up catching myself, repeating myself a little bit, but I mean, how can you not when we're talking about the same, new same stuff? But yeah. Yeah. The best, the best stories are the best stories. Yeah, for exactly. Reason, right? you know, yeah. Like, everyone wants to know about the party. Everyone there. wants to know about Doug Pulse's bitch ass and whatever. Like, you know, <laughs> let's go. I mean, the thing is with Doug, man, it's like, he bullies people and people just back down because he's so intimidating and he's got a big following and you know he's posting YouTube videos and like I'm not gonna back down. I've been doing this shit my whole life. I guarantee you I've been in more fights than he's ever been. And I can guarantee you that. You know, so like I'm a fighter, bro. Like I you know, I don't fight anymore, you know, but you know, I used to have, my sister put me through hell growing up, man. I had to fight a lot. And it's like, man, like I'm not gonna back down, dude. Like I don't care. You know, you can't question my integrity when when I do the things I do for people. It's not even close. So whatever. Well, I'm glad you at least get to say your piece. Like, I, I hate how divisive everyone has to be in every aspect of, of life, it seems to be, especially, I mean, specifically for us anyway, poker, which I don't know, should be one of those very easy things outside of calling out cheaters. I don't know. I feel like we should all yeah. like fucking hug and sing Kumbaya, but and mind their own business if it's not like <laughs> yeah. cheating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Either way, I, Chris, really appreciate it, man. Like, uh, I, I know we played together for years. I was probably, well, probably longer we've ever talked combined. Uh, but I don't know. I've always enjoyed playing with the table and I, I appreciate you coming on here with us. Likewise, sure. man. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. And, and you know, and be non-poker. Let's blow this thing up. All right. That's the pot. <laughs> thanks, man. Hey, me and my buddy, we make it all of this money. Yeah, I know it's rude to be bragging. They never catching a slack. Me and my buddy, we working hard for this money. Oh, you know I've been in my bag. Buddy, I got it like that. Yeah, y'all better stop. Me and my boy going.